Hello and welcome to another edition of Real Israelis, Real Lives. This is a pivot that we have twisted to in the last moment, over the last four weeks, where as part of Congregation Shah HaShemayim's SLC, Shah Learning Center, we have been speaking with ordinary Israelis living extraordinary lives. And my guest for today is Shlomo Klein. And Shlomo, it is a real honor and pleasure to be able to speak with you. Thank you so much for making time to be with us here this evening. Yeah, sure. It's my pleasure. No Shlomo, problem. tell me uh, in a few quick fire questions, where were you born? Um, I was born in Israel, in Adassa Haaretzafim, a hospital old, in Jerusalem. How old are you? I'm 21. And which army unit do you currently serve in? Um, and can you tell me where this interview is taking place from? Um, Shikum Tel Shomer. So and rehabilitation. Listeners, can you translate that in the fullest translation and give an um, explanation? Yeah, it's the rehabilitation center for army for um injured uh soldiers in Tel Shomer, which is a hospital in Israel in Tel Aviv. A rehabilitation center that the Tel Shomer hospital has uh transitioned over to um in order to be able to provide a a rehab center for all of the army and all of the soldiers who are currently going through rehab. Yeah. Yeah. With your permission, Shlomo from your hospital bed, could you share with us a little bit of your story starting from October 7th? Where were you? What were you doing? Uh, and the uh, uh, the events of that day? Sure. sure. I was um, lying in my bed at 6 a.m. or I was actually sleeping. Um, uh, on a, in my army base. Um, my regular base where I was serving. What and is the name of the base? It's called Mutsav Sufa. And how far is that from the Gaza border? Mm, I checked it yesterday. It's probably a kilometer, a kilometer away. One kilometer. Uh, and this is yeah. the closest IDF army base to Gaza. One of them. Okay. Um, yeah, one of them, it's, definitely. It's six o'clock in the morning. You're asleep in bed. Yeah. What what happened? Sleep in bed. Um, so I hear a bunch of explosions and um kind of like it's happens every once in a while on my base. Um we have artillery outside the base. So I was thought nothing of it. Um and then I heard one very close, like I'd say three, four hundred meters away, and it was loud. And so I woke up, got scared, uh, got dressed, grabbed my gun, which was a machine gun. It's uh, the biggest gun, uh, one of the biggest guns in the army. It's a smaller version of the mag. And um, so I grabbed it and I ran into the bomb shelter. Uh, I was hanging out there with my friends for like 20 minutes. Or so how long sorry 20 minutes okay or half an hour and then uh and we got a notification the the commander got a notification that there was terrorists outside the base so he yells that there's terrorists outside the base um uh go get your gear and gear He's, he basically says gear up get ready for war um so everyone goes to gear up and get their gear from their rooms i actually decided not to go get my gear because i said there's terrorists out the side the base my room's close to the entrance yeah, i don't think so um and i think that was one of my smartest decisions that day um yeah and we lost a few friends 
on that mission to go get gear. Uh, so because my the friends... terrorists had already infiltrated the base. No, they were outside, but they shot onto the inside. The people that were saw that obviously that they saw running around. Right. Uh, so uh, the people that did come back with gear, I started going without gear. I started um, chasing them or looking for them without gear. And the people that came back with gear, there were six people that came back. There were two commanders, three other soldiers, and me. But I was without gear. I was just with the machine gun. Um, and we started uh, like going towards them, um, which were which was towards the entrance of the base. And one of my friends caught me and stopped me and said, "Here, take my gear." which was really meant a lot because it was obviously everyone wants to go kill the the terrorists and really wants to defend their base. And it meant a lot to me that he gave me his gear. He said, you'd be safe. You have the biggest gun. Take the gear. I don't want you going out without gear. Um, so we kind of got re really close to the entrance. So my commander told me to start shooting. So I jumped on the hood of a car. Uh, for protection and started uh, shooting um, at them. Uh, and we decided to, we didn't see anyone. So we decided to get closer. We stopped seeing them. So we decided to get closer and open the corner, which they were behind. So we stopped shooting and we started going close slowly, obviously, because it's, it's a scary moment. Um, and at that moment, right when I was about to open the corner, I see a grenade at my feet or at my friend's feet. And I right away, <laughs> um, someone yells grenade and we all start running. I outran that grenade. I went back into the bomb shelter, which was also nearby. Um, and caught the corner of the bomb shelter with my friends um and we're guarding the bomb shelter because we knew if they get into the bomb shelter we're not good they take over the base basically and we knew that couldn't happen no way um so we were we're on the corner of the bomb shelter um i'm guarding one way my friend's guarding the other way um i tell my other friend to guard the other way and another one is over me telling me, okay, I'm shooting over your head. If you get up, um, I'm going to shoot you in the head. I said, oh, okay. <laughs> um, and I'm shooting away, firing my machine gun. It's really fast. It shoots 500 rounds a minute. Wow. So I'm firing, firing away at whoever I saw. Um, I definitely saw someone there. And my friend who's next to me, who's less covered, I'd say, gets right a bullet to the neck. And I, I right away take cover because I'm shot at. He died on the spot right there. And then I knew it um, right away. Um, and I took cover and put down my gun. Uh, right when I put down my, like, I put down my gun. And I waited for a few bullets to fly by. I waited for the for them to stop shooting. I was about five, six seconds. Um, and I put out my hand to try to get his body because the last thing I wanted was for Hamas to take his body. So I grabbed, I put out my hand to grab his body and my hand went flying back. Um, and I screamed. I was like, ow. Oh. Um, and I right there, and then I got a bullet to the arm, to the forearm, um, right. and I ran. Yeah, what? Yeah, I ran them. inside. Yeah, I ran inside and yelled, "I got a bullet! I got a bullet! Put on someone! Put on a tourniquet! Someone put on a tourniquet! Don't go easy on me! Put on a tourniquet!" Um, and he put a tourniquet on the top of my arm. On my a, turn a turner kit for those who might not know is essentially a strap 
that is tightened over a limb to stop the blood flow, correct? Yeah, correct. Uh, so that you would stop bleeding, theoretically. Uh, and uh, so they put on the tourniquet. I, I told them, don't go easy on me. I don't want to die. And I laid down on the floor of the bomb shelter and I was crying in pain. Um, and a few minutes later, or 20, I think, mean, 10, 20 minutes later, I, um, the, the commander says, they're coming into the bomb shelter. They're coming into the bomb shelter. Get back. So we went to the corner of the bomb shelter. Um, it was a pretty big one. It was, it's pretty big. It was also the eating room, the dining room. Okay. So we grabbed all the fridges we could find. We grabbed all the serving desks, all the tables, chairs, whatever we found. And we built a, a wall or a cover. And we had four or five guys that could shoot. The rest were injured. Um, we had, uh, I'd say we were 20, 25 guys in there, maybe less. I don't know. We were, um, there was like six or seven chefs that didn't know how to use a gun. There were six, six or seven injured, eight, um, there were four or five that knew how to use a gun and were covering the front entrance. And um, the rest were, I don't know. I don't know. And uh, so I was in with my tourniquet and I took off all my clothes to see that I didn't have any other bleeding. I would, I tap, dapped my whole body around just to check that I didn't have any other bleeding. Um, so I was in boxers with a tourniquet on my arm and I was lying on the floor while they were throwing at us grenades inside into the bomb shelter and shooting over our heads. So I was uh, watching bullets fly over my head, grenades exploding seven, eight meters away from me, um, RPGs flying to the walls, um, you know, the walls breaking down, the ceiling was falling the lights were cracking. Uh, they would turn on and off every few hours. Um, and then and there was this one chef that was holding me and telling me everything was going to be okay. Everything's going to be okay. We're going to get out of this. We're going to drink a beer later. I still owe him that beer. But uh, wow. yet to find, I'm yet to find him. But he was, he was also a... Uh, cozy guy so I was comfortable on him <laughs> um and he was yeah he was you he, he really calmed me down and it was unbelievable what went on in there it was people were were with tourniquets and bleeding and there was someone who was bleeding from his hip and I was we were all just like lying in his blood and he was it's all gonna be okay and we're gonna get out of this and um, and then at one thirty, so seven hours later, um, yeah. After all this, um, came in. Um, the Navy SEALs of Israel, I think they are. Um, they came. They came to like we got an order. We the commander got a text that that it was all through the regular phone because Hamas blocked blocked the communication system so it was my my commander got a text that the navy is, is coming the navy the seals are coming and so we were all yes thank god thank god i personally thought that it would take them hours uh, to to you know make the area clean of terrorists and get us out of there but they were pretty quick uh they came half an hour they cleared up the, only the back area, so we would have area to space to run, uh, like run out of the base and get to safety. And but so the danger was was we weren't sure if they were terrorists acting to be the seals or if they were actual. Oh, wow. They came in. They came in yelling Shmaisa, Hashem Elokim, Hashem Echad, 
and with who like who does I wait there's a in the army there's a, like something that you do you yell tal 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 and like you know we couldn't we didn't we couldn't we couldn't trust them because they didn't yell the right thing so we were stand back stand back don't come in um and they came close and we were all ready to fire um and thank god we didn't um but they so they came in with a light he said okay i'm putting in a blue light there commander said we're i'm putting in a blue light um if you guys see it say you see it and don't shoot um and we they put in the blue light and we we saw it we said hey we see it we see it we see it and everyone celebrated yes 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 it's them i saw them come in i grabbed the first person i saw and i said get me out of here and he grabbed my back i could run because i had nothing wrong with my feet um and we ran um me and him through the crossfire to safety how many hours were you pinned down in the bomb shelter of the base shooting Seven. back fight fighting back as they were throwing grenades and rpgs and and th literally throwing bombs into that room how long were you in there uh, we were seven hours yeah seven hours seven hours with 25 soldiers and only five of you that were able to yeah. be shooting yeah. yeah and the navy seals yeah. come in and they save everyone in that room yeah everyone in that room uh there were a few casualties uh, in that room but most mostly saved mostly saved are you feeling okay that you can continue the story i know that you of course no of course, okay. Of course, yeah. Yeah. okay so you run through the crossfire out yeah. of the base that is overrun yeah. with terrorists with the yeah. navy seals helping you out through a back corridor <laughs> What yeah. happens next? So we get to safety and I'm thrilled. I'm over the moon. Yeah, so, okay. But I still have a tourniquet on my arm for seven hours, which is not okay. Um, it's right. not, it's already damaged my arm. My arm at that point was already damaged. Um, and I knew it. And I said, uh, okay, I have to get to the hospital as fast as I can. Um, and I was sitting there, I saw, I said hi to my friends that were also outside in war, uh, like fighting, and mm -hmm. they were okay. And then I said hi to the, and I said to the people that were with me, I was hugging them. And, and I realized that nothing is really, nothing's really going on with the hospital or there's no ambulance or there's no, nobody to take me. So i started getting things done on my own um they were i was arguing with the people there uh they were they didn't do anything wrong they were waiting for permission to from the higher ups to go but i wasn't gonna take that i was wanted to get to the hospital so i said uh no way uh i took seven guys that i that were injured i put them in the car and i told the driver i said start driving or I'm going to start driving. Uh, and he started driving and his commander called him back and I was pissed off. Uh, so I started yelling at her. I was yelling at her and I was going nuts. So she said, okay, okay, fine. Um, we'll send you with someone else. So she sent us with another, with her soldier, with one of her soldiers. And um, we started going, and she takes us to this place where there's medics there. But I told her, uh, I'm not a medic, but I told her, I'm a medic. I, I don't need a medic right now. I need a hospital. I can, I, I need a hospital. So I was explaining as calm as I can at that point well, with a tourniquet while I was in boxers. Um, and I was explaining to her, I was like, I'm a medic. I don't need a medic right now. I need a hospital. She says, okay, okay, fine, fine, fine. Like, we'll, start, we'll, we'll go to our real place. We're, we're going to a place where there's a helicopter. So we start driving, and uh, we get to this corner of the street, and she's trying to communicate. I realize she's trying to communicate with the helicopter. She's asking him where he can land. She's 
trying to not not really understanding him and i realized the helicopters can't land where we are i said no way that a helicopter is landing here um there's no place that a helicopter can land here so i took the phone away from her and i spoke to the helicopter myself i said hi i'm a medic i'm the highest i'm the highest medical person around here i need i have this this and this the number of um injured uh one of them is injured hard with this and this another one i'm injured with a tourniquet on my arm and another one's injured with this and this and another one has shrapnel shrapnel um to the head and and then another one has a tourniquet on his leg. And where can we meet you? Where can you land? And he said, I can land here and here. I said, okay, I need you really fast. And he said, okay, I'll be there in four minutes. So we put in the point where he gave us in the map. And we got there in four minutes. The helicopter came after a few minutes. And we got on the helicopter. And that's basically it. And then I got, I was in the hospital a day and I got moved to a different hospital and now I'm here in the, another hospital incredible <laughs> a month later incredible yeah. I'm sure there's a journey ahead of you for your arm and I know that you're in our prayers <clears throat> and whenever we pray we include you and there should be a refer shalema that there should be movement in your arm sensation and please God a return you. back to full health thank you Shlomo, to hear you speak is inspirational and humbling at the same time. And for everybody that's here listening live and everyone that is listening to the recording of this, I just want people to realize that here you were on an army base and within minutes of being woken up to have grabbed the largest machine gun available and started firing and protected the base and to be able to then save lives and then as the story later developed seven hours pinned into a bomb shelter literally clinging on until the navy seals got there and then to navigate a helicopter rescue mission with seven of your comrades who were all injured and and fly them to a hospital this is what we are talking about when we talk about the heroes of the idea. When we talk about the heroes of the Jewish people, you know, Mon Montreal, like so many cities around the world, th th there are Jewish communities that are having a hard time right now. And they're hurting for two reasons. They're hurting because they're watching what's happening in Israel and they feel helpless. And they're donating Sadaka, and that's incredible. And they're trying to help but they are wringing their hands because they feel, what can I do? What can I do? And diaspora communities are also hurting because of the anti-Semitism that is rising its head now around the globe and Montreal in particular. I want you to know that while you, I don't know what you think of yourself. I don't know what you think of the events of October 7th. You are literally one of the heroes of our people. And you're somebody that gives us not only pride in the state of Israel and pride to be Jewish, you help us through this difficult time. You allow Jews the world over to stand tall because of who you are and the person that you are. And so in the humblest of ways, I'm not qualified to say this, but thank you. Thank you. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. And we're very appreciative. So thank you. Uh, sure. uh, thank you. Very, yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening. I know it wasn't anytime. straightforward. And I really thank appreciate you. it. On behalf of everyone that is watching and listening, truly. Mamash to Darabalacha. Thank you so much. Bye. Thanks so much. Well. Rafur Shalema.